What is up, everyone? Welcome to the No Cap Space. I'm Tyler, joined today by Emily Adams. And Emily, you have a very unique circumstances here because we're time. It's time to talk South Carolina and UConn. And right now, you're a writer at the Hartford Current, and you were just a writer at the Greenville News. So you have the very unique experience of covering both of these teams in one season. So who else to get to talk about this big game than you? So thank you so much for for coming through today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. This is this has sort of been my yeah my magnum opus week of like <laughs> every everybody wants to talk to me this week. <laughs> I believe it. you're the star of the show, and like of course, because this game is. I feel like it was this game that's kind of been now. I think it was since like 2015 that this game has has been around, and it was this one and then SC LSU that kind of mm-hmm. felt like the two games everyone circled going into this season, and. It's been South Carolina, I think, has overachieved and UConn struggled at the beginning and then kind of have picked it back up. And now we're here where these are two, once again, top teams in the nation. But South Carolina isn't going to be full strength. And I think that's the biggest storyline going into this game is that Camila Cardoso is not going to be here. She's on international duty playing with Brazil. So for you, when you're thinking about, okay, What are they losing and how do they try and make up for that? What are you kind of thinking from the South Carolina perspective with that? Yeah, I I described it this way to somebody earlier, but I think it's a way bigger win for UConn than it is a loss for South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I'm not necessarily worried about their post rotation without Camilla. Like, I think they match up just fine with that Ashlyn and Chloe lineup on the floor. I, I mean, personally really like when those two play together. Mm -hmm. Um, I think especially because UConn is so small, they don't need Camilla's size to be, you know, contenders with UConn like they would against like a UCLA type of team. Um, But for UConn, losing the 6'7 player on the floor is a huge, huge deal. Right. Um, And it makes Aaliyah Edwards' life a whole lot easier. Um, You know, she has been really, really good recently about a not getting herself into foul trouble and b getting other teams into foul trouble mm-hmm. um she's been at the line a lot so you know for a young team with young posts that you know ashlyn watkins that's kind of her her biggest ding right now is right. that she exactly into foul trouble um you know chloe's not immune to it so i think way more scenarios emerge for uconn where they can win without mm-hmm. camilla on the floor i still think south carolina is I mean, the the odds away favorite to right. win regardless. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you where it's like, yeah, this doesn't mean that South Carolina is going to lose by any means, but they absolutely wish that Camila Cardoso was there. And I think a, a huge point that you brought up is the depth. But you're absolutely right that Watkins is as great as she is, as like the, the sky is the limit with her. The foul trouble is where the issue is right now. And that's where Camila has kind of been able to step in and just because all she got to do is put them damn arms up. And what once them arms go up, you ain't really getting a shot off on Camila Cardoso. Like it's very few players in the country that that can do that. But you did mention a player that I want to talk about on the UConn side, Aaliyah Edwards, because Aaliyah Edwards has been fantastic throughout, especially this recent stretch mm-hmm. of games. You mentioned the foul trouble, like like getting other teams into foul trouble. Is that the main thing that you've been noticing that has kind of propelled her to this next level recently, or is there something else that also kind of comes into play? Yeah, I think a lot of it, honestly, I mean, as sort of sad as it is, I think losing Aubrey Griffin challenged her a lot, Mm -hmm. um, especially on the rebounding side. I mean, they had a couple of games where the rebounding was just really, really bad. They were getting out rebounded by teams that they were beating by 30 Mm -hmm. just because they weren't getting anything on the boards. Um, And so I think at some point, Aaliyah, it just kind of clicked in for her. Yeah, Um, She had a season high last night against Seton Hall in a game where they played on a whole really poorly. Yeah, Um, You know, she had 15 rebounds in her double-double. I think she had more rebounds. She might have 18 points, 15 rebounds. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it was a tough line regardless. So it was, it was very good. It's, she's just been so consistent. Yeah, Um, She's looked much more dominant has been the big thing to me like she she's taking contact better that was always the thing that used to drive me crazy watching her was that she struggled to kind of return physicality when it was being given to her um and i think she's done a way better job especially in this recent stretch of you know being comfortable standing her ground and and really owning that that space in the low post and 
I mean, it's it's been huge for them. I don't know where they are without her the last five, six games. Right. And I think that's such a huge factor for UConn is that they now have somebody else to rely on. Because there's been so many times at this point, especially early on this season, where it was like, it's, it's Paige or bust. And and like nothing like and you you kind of just gotta hope that page is is on and there was a lot of just page watching it felt like and that's progressively changed and like as the season's gone on and now that you get Edwards in mm-hmm. it's, it, now it's a whole different level of like kind of what the heights that this team can reach for for you you mentioned kind of being able to take the contact more and things like that do you feel like it's just kind of been that level of kind of mental shift for Aaliyah a, a to be able to start putting these stats up like this in this stretch or do you feel like it's also uh kind of the team itself positioning themselves to try and get Aaliyah more involved yeah I think it's definitely a combination of both I mean I think you know the the Notre Dame game first of all was not that long ago and kind of we saw it it sort of bite them when they moved away from her Mm -hmm. late in that game um and I think they they took that very seriously like I mean they have really stuck with her even you know when the shootings cooled off she had a little bit of a a slump um, late against Seton Hall and, you know, Paige kind of just was comfortable stepping into that. They kept going to her, they kept beating her and she, you know, it it came back around eventually. So I I think, you know, it's Gino has, has shown a lot more comfort in kind of letting her run the show a little bit more even than Paige sometimes, which again, I think they need just because they lack so much presence in the post because they don't, they, I mean, Aaliyah is is truly all they've got yeah um and and yeah I mean with Paige and Aaliyah too I think they're just working better together too you know it's Paige made the point a a couple games ago you know they came in in the same class they've always had a good connection Mm -hmm. but they really hadn't played that many games together yeah all all things concerned um and so I think you know it is starting to come together for them they're starting to kind of you know find that flow with each other Mm -hmm. more easily um, and I think that's why you're seeing their lines be more balanced. You know, you're not getting the sort of, you know, Aaliyah with a, you know, 12.7 rebounds. Yeah, right. 30 and nine. Right. You're seeing them more kind of, you know, 20 and 20 apiece. <laughs> more normal stuff. Which is huge for them to be able to yeah. to find that balance. And do you feel like, uh, how how have you kind of seen the the team shift? Because I was at the, for me, like the, the, the checkpoint game early on this season was that Texas game. Yeah. for UConn I was there in person I got like I was in the press conference after and Gino was just like we're just watching Paige and we're just like and the way that Paige taking seven dribbles on a possession is not how Paige succeeds and it feels like since that whether it's been the freshman getting more minutes both kind of by choice and also just being forced to with all the injuries like where where have you kind of seen like just team-wide kind of the biggest shifts from let's say that Texas game that non-con kind of stretch to now going into the South Carolina game yeah, I mean, I think the freshmen have been a huge part of that, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really am high on both of them. Um, you know, they've they've sort of had their freshman ups and downs, right. I think. Um, but the highs have been really, really good and really, yeah. really promising. Um, and they're not coming as one offs. You know, they're they're, you know, Ashlyn Shade is is scoring 10 plus more often than she's not. I think they're yeah. both averaging double digits right now and if they're not one of them it's close like, yeah it's it's right around there for sure yeah so i mean i think the two of them just getting more comfortable and i mean quite literally just like learning the offense right. learning the defense learning you know to to play with a page beckers who they grew up watching in right. a lot of yeah. ways you know she she was on the cover of slam in high school when they're you know 11 12 years old mm. And so, you know, I think it is, there's a learning curve to that, right, learning right. to to play with someone like that, as opposed to watching them play. Um, and I think, yeah, that's something that really made a big difference for them when you saw it start, you know, going better with, right. with that. Right. And you, we talked about the, the Texas game there. I, I do kind of talk about, you, you mentioned Paige as well, the, the guard matchups as a whole in this game are very interesting to me, because obviously the star in the guard lineup for both teams is Paige, but like obviously South Carolina also has incredible guard play at this point. And guard play has kind of been something that UConn has struggled with at times. Like they struggled against Rory uh, in, in Texas. They, they struggled against UCLA. We just saw Hannah do what she did in that Notre Dame uh, UConn game. So for you, I guess kind of, how are you projecting this kind of guard matchup between pow, pow Raven and, and breezy versus 
Page and 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 UConn in this because I'm that's kind of what I have my eye on on top of the big situation here. Yeah, I think the defensive matchups especially are going to be fascinating mm-hmm. in terms of kind of who ends up where. Yeah. Um, you know, the the one thing that makes UConn really dangerous is that they just have so many players who can shoot. You know, even even Aaliyah recently has kind of pulled out a little bit of a midi that's, that's yeah. really good here and there. Um, and, and Ice Brady has one, too. I mean, she's hit a couple of, of threes this year. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, you end up with with Raven and KK presumably paired just mm-hmm. on the basis of speed, right. <laughs> you know, to, the only one keeping up with, with either of them is mm-hmm. the other. Um, and then I think, you know, you end up probably with, with breezy on page because I don't think pow is, is at the point defensively. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I that's, mm-hmm. you know, all love to pow, but that, yeah. you know, that's it's, sort of a that's different a, level of assignment. It's, it's a very tough test. It's, it's, it's a, just any guard. It's, it's page. Like, yeah, and and so I think you then end up with with Nika and Pau matched up, mm. um, which I think that one can be really interesting because you know Nika's been really really good on high scoring guards this mm-hmm. year. She's kind of their best sort of you know point of attack perimeter one v one defender. Um, really locked up uh, unique Drake from St. John's both both times they played really, but especially mm. that first time. Um, and and Pau, uh, you know, when I was looking the other day, she has not been as good from three you know, the last stretch here mm-hmm. as she was, you know, earlier during the non-conference slate. Um, and, and neither has Paige, quite frankly. She's yeah. also been in a in a tough slump from three. But, you know, if either of them can keep the other from hitting, I think that's going to be a really, really big factor if if Nika can keep Powell locked up or if Breezy can keep Paige locked up. Yeah. I do think it's – what have you, you kind of thought of, of Nika's uh, role kind of – throughout this season because it's been kind of an interesting one to watch trying to obviously last season taking on so much responsibility and then now this year kind of finding that place again with different lineups now every feels like every game not every game but like UConn just had so many injury issues and like her kind of finding that consistency and that consistent role so how have you kind of seen her role develop and and where do you kind of see it playing into this game? Yeah, that was a big part, I think, too, of some of the learning curve for them was just navigating her and Paige together, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, just as as two ball handlers and, and mm-hmm. even then adding KK to that mix as well. You know, she is is a point guard by nature. Um, and so I, I think Nika, you know, it, it, she's obviously the two time, you know, Big East defensive player of the right. year, all that, like that's where where so much of her impact has been. But I think she's really kind of just been there their fill-in piece (laughs) whatever isn't working nika has kind of has stepped in to fill the void you know she's she's pulled out her her three-point shots gotten a lot better this year um she's become much more of a a shooting threat Mm -hmm. um she's had some some higher scoring games she's had you know multiple double digit assist games you know i I think there's a really good connection with her and Paige, with her and Aaliyah. Uh, even, you know, with her and the freshmen starting to develop, you've seen some with with her and KK the last couple of games. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think as, yeah, as those, you know, facilitating type of, of connections and, you know, court vision things start to build with a young team and an right. inexperienced team, um, I think it's really elevated her for them. And I think, you know, you saw the the game where she had foul trouble right uh, was was a disaster for them mm-hmm. and i think mm-hmm. that really spoke to i mean just how important her presence is they just she's she's so solid all the time in you know doing right. the, the dirty work stuff right absolutely and that's what's i mean that's always what's been most impressive to me is just her flexibility in as we've seen her be asked so many different things it, it feels like she's able to find comfortability in any role and and is okay with doing that like whether it be being the primary ball handler or just being the dirty work defender like she's so capable of doing it feels like everything like on the court and like and she's been asked to do it's it's kind of been trial by combat a lot of the time just to try and figure out how to even do these things for her so that's been interesting to to kind of see over the course of her career but i do want to ask one key for each team in this game, what are they going to have to do to get the win? One for each team. What What do you got for us? Okay, one key. I think, I, I think the key for UConn. And this is like a very basic, like mm-hmm. non basketball one, but I, I think they need to be like within 
a score at, mm. at, at, at halftime because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have been in a sold out Colonial Life Arena yeah. a few times. Um, I, I've been in a sold out XL Center. You know, I've I've been at the Final Four last year. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, a sold out Colonial Life Arena is maybe the loudest environment I've ever been in. Like mm -hmm. it's I mean, it's a really, really intense place to play in a game like that, that, you know, the fan base takes so seriously, mm -hmm. the students are going to take seriously because it's UConn, you know, the, the players are their family. Like, you know, this is a really big deal game in, mm -hmm. in Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, with a young team and a team that has been prone to sluggish starts as of yeah. late yeah um first quarters and first halves have not gone well for them you know in this this biggie stretch even as they're dominating right um and if you let south carolina start putting points on you early it's it's gonna be over yeah you know, I, I think that's what we saw you know with notre dame um for for south carolina mm -hmm. you know at the beginning of the year notre dame got down early and it just there was no coming back at all. No, um, once they start snowballing, it it can yeah. get nasty quick. Like and, and and UConn, frankly, doesn't have the personnel to, you know, chase South Carolina down on defense mm -hmm. and you know be running at their pace the whole game. And so I think if if they cannot dictate pace a little bit in the first half and, and you know come out looking competitive, mm -hmm. it's not it's not going to get much better. Right. Um, so and and then for South Carolina. I think for them, honestly, I think the biggest thing might be to stay out of foul trouble. Uh, quite yeah. honestly, now with the news that just came out that that um, Jaw is yeah. probably not going to be available on Sunday either. Now you're down two players in your post rotation. You know they they have depth there, but you know you get Watkins on the bench with three fouls. You get any of the guards in mm -hmm. some foul trouble. You know Full Wiley obviously is a little right. bit foul prone at times. Um, you know, I, I think they find themselves in a risky situation with personnel groupings that they are not comfortable with mm -hmm. on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, if if Sakima Walker is playing a lot of minutes in this game, I, I think, you know, that is going to be a risky situation. Yeah, no, that's 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 a win for UConn. Like, if and, you know, again, not not that I think they can't win in that scenario. I think yeah. there's a, a very real situation where South Carolina just wins this game, even if UConn. Mm -hmm plays its its best possible performance yeah um but i think this game for uconn is about giving themselves a chance as yeah. much as possible yeah no i definitely agree with that because like south carolina like the margin for error for any team playing against south carolina is slim to none like Truly, yeah. and <laughs> even even with you could you could get them in foul trouble you could have camilla obviously not playing i don't it doesn't matter i don't like <laughs> you're, you're playing south carolina at home yeah Come and on. that's, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it is an underrated factor how mm. hard it is to play that team at mm -hmm. home. I mean, we saw LSU won a national championship last year and they got embarrassed at CLA. Yeah. South Carolina goes to LSU this year, arguably playing better than they were last year with LSU arguably playing worse than they were last mm -hmm. year. And it's a much closer game because the PMAC is, is a is very insane. similar yeah. environment. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, again, especially on teams that are starting freshmen, playing freshmen for very significant minutes, playing first time starters for significant minutes, those things matter a, a lot more than than the basketball X's and O's do sometimes. Right. right. No, I, I completely agree. And you and you talk about that environment. You even said like in, in the Yukon answer of that, where it was like, it means a lot in Columbia. This game means a lot. So we have someone boots on the ground tonight. We're recording this on Thursday night. South Carolina is getting ready to play. Shawnee is there, boots on the ground, and she phoned in a question for you, Emily. Here, here we go. Well, let's, let's, here we go. What's going on? It's your girl, Shawnee Sean, reporting live from Colonial Life Arena, where fans are once again excited for another matchup. Tonight, it's going to be Missouri. Sunday, it's going to be Yukon. So, Emily, my question for you is, on the Yukon side, do they consider this a rivalry yet? Do they consider this a rivalry, Emily? Is this officially a rivalry game at this point? So it's a good question. It's actually, it's funny because Gino talked about it a little bit last night um, post game. Um, I think they definitely do quite yeah. honestly. I, I think it, it very much is one on both sides now. And especially this year, I think is making it feel more like that than it ever has before. Because I think this is the first time UConn has truly been an underdog in it. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously you have the years where UConn's ranked below them. South Carolina comes in as number one. There've been, 
plenty of those. Yeah, right. Um, but even last year, South Carolina goes in number one, had never beaten UConn in the state of Connecticut mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, it's they're truly just now starting to kind of even the score a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, And I think now this year going in as, you know, this is not a number one and number two, number one and number three, you know, this is for for one seeding. This is a potential national championship preview. I don't think it feels like that for UConn Mm -hmm. right now because they haven't beaten a team of that caliber yet. They've played plenty of them. They've looked decent against some Mm -hmm. of them. They've beaten ranked opponents. But, you know, to to go and and play an opponent like South Carolina right now. You know, I think I don't know what the lines are, but I'd imagine they're they're a pretty significant underdog yeah. relative to you know any time in the last two decades. Yeah. Um. So it's it's a really fascinating year for that question, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. because I think this this year it, it feels like it is becoming more of a true rivalry than it ever has before. Well, listen, I'm here for the chaos. So I absolutely hope that this just continues to grow and grow. And I think that's a great point about like being an underdog. Cause when have you ever been able to say that the Yukon Huskies right. are underdogs? <laughs> I, 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 that might be genuinely the first time I've ever heard that sentence. Cause that's never, that's, that's not the case. That doesn't and and have it been fully accurate, you know, yeah. where the, the general consensus is. Yeah. Y'all like y'all are supposed to lose this game. Out. We don't say that about right. Yukon, but here we are. With Don, the powerhouse that she's built, like this is years in the making at yeah. this point that for, for South Carolina to be at this point. But all I know is I'm excited for the game. Emily, thank you so much for coming through and giving us the breakdown on it with your expertise on both games. If you are not subscribed to the No Cap Space, make sure you do that down below. And you can find the link to our playback as well. where We will be watching the game live. It's free to sign up. Come through and watch with us. And we'll see you next time.